right, welcome back to Anne of Green Gables chapter 10. This is called Anne's Apology. Anne's Apology. Uh, first word is refractory, rejoinder, obdurate, smote. Wanely, oblige. Now, this is penitent. I misspelled it. I left it there. It should be penitence. So if you want to change it or just know that that's the word you're looking for, not penitent. I already had the copies made, so I didn't fix them. Abasement. Plumed. Plumed. Officious. Benefactor. Gyration. On the back, the questions are, number one, what was Matthew's response to the story Marilla told him? What was Matthew's response to the story Marilla told him? Number two, what prompted Anne to change her mind about apologizing to Mrs. Lind? Number three, what did Marilla understand that Rachel did not. Number four, do you think Anne's apology was sincere? Why or why not? Oh my gosh, this is so good. I can't even tell you. Does it? Uh, that person did with their aunt. All right, here we go. Chapter 10. So exciting, so exciting. Anne's apology. Marilla said nothing to Matthew about the affair that evening. But when Anne proved still refractory or resisting control or authority, she's stubborn or unmanageable. The next morning, an explanation had to be made to account for her absence at the breakfast table. So, Marilla's still taking her food. She just doesn't get to come down and eat with everybody else. Okay? Marilla told Matthew the whole story, taking pains to impress him with a due sense of the enormity of Anne's behavior. It's a good thing Rachel Lynn got a calling down. She's a meddlesome old gossip, was Matthew's consolatory rejoinder. Uh, was his consolatory reply or an answer to a reply. Matthew Cuthbert, I'm astonished at you. You know that Anne's behavior was dreadful, and yet you take her part or her side. I suppose you'll be saying next thing that she oughtn't to be punished at all. Well, now, no, not exactly, said Matthew uneasily. I reckon she ought to be punished a little, but don't be too hard on her, Marilla. Recollect or remember, she hasn't ever had anyone to teach her right. You're, you're going to give her something to eat, aren't you? When did you ever hear of me starving people into good behavior? Demanded Marilla indignantly. She'll have her meals regular, and I'll carry them up to her myself. But she'll stay up there until she's willing to apologize to Mrs. Lynn. And that's final, Matthew. Breakfast, dinner, and supper were very silent meals. For Anne still remained obdurate. Resistance to persuasion or softening influences. After each meal, Marilla carried up a well-filled tray to the east gable and brought it down later on not noticeably depleted. So basically, she's not eating, and not eating a lot. Matthew eyed its last descent with a troubled eye. Had Anne eaten anything at all? When Marilla went out that evening to bring the cows in, bring the cows from the back pasture, Matthew, who had been hanging about the barns and watching, slipped into the house with an air of a burglar and crept upstairs. 
As a general thing, Matthew gravitated between the kitchen and the little bedroom off the hall where he slept. Once in a while, he ventured uncomfortably into the parlor or the sitting room when the minister came to tea, but he had never been upstairs in his own house since the spring he helped Marilla paper the spare bedroom, and that was four years ago. So he's not been upstairs in four years. He tiptoed along the hall and stood for several minutes outside the door of the east gable before he summoned courage to tap on it with his fingers and then open the door to peep in. Anne was sitting on the yellow chair by the window, gazing mournfully out into the garden. Very small and unhappy she looked, and Matthew's heart smote him. Smote means to affect as if by striking, or his heart hurt like it had been hit. He softly closed the door and tiptoed over to her. Anne, he whispered as if afraid of being overheard. How are you making it, Anne? Anne smiled wanly, lacking vitality or she's like feeble, kind of like an old person who can't walk very well. Pretty well. I imagine a good deal and and that helps to pass the time. Of course, it's it's rather lonesome. But then I may as well get used to that. Anne smiled again, bravely facing the long years of solitary imprisonment before her. Matthew recollected that he must say what he had to co had come to say without loss of time, lest Marilla return prematurely. Well now, Anne, don't you think you'd better do it and have it over with? He whispered. It'll have to be done sooner or later, you know, for Marilla's a dreadful determined woman. Dreadful determined, Anne. Do it right off, I say, and have it over. Do you mean apologize to Mrs. Lynde? Yes, apologize. That's the very word, said Matthew eagerly. J just smooth it over, so to speak. That's what I was trying to get at. So is Matthew saying apologize for real, or is he saying do it to make Marilla happy, right? I suppose I could do it to oblige you, to do it as a favor to you, said Anne thoughtfully. It would be true enough to say I'm, I am sorry, because... I am now. I wasn't a bit last night. I was mad clear through, and I stayed mad all night. I know I did, because I woke up three times, and I was just as furious every time. But this morning, it was over. I wasn't in a temper anymore, and it left a dreadful sort of goneness, too. I felt so ashamed of myself, but I just couldn't think of going and telling Mrs. Lynn so. It would be so humiliating. I made up my mind I'd stay shut up here forever rather than do that. But still, I I'd do anything for you, if you really want me to. Well, now, of course I do. It's terrible lonesome downstairs without you. Just go and smooth things over. That's a good girl. Very well, said Anne resignedly. I'll tell Marilla as soon as she comes in that I've repented. That's right, that, that's right, Anne. But, but don't tell Marilla I said anything about it. She might think I was putting my oar in, and I promise not to do that. Wild horses won't drag the secret from me, promised Anne, solemnly. How would wild horses drag a secret from a person anyhow? But Matthew was gone, scared at his own success. He fled hastily to the remotest corner of the horse pasture, lest Marilla should suspect what he had been up to. Marilla herself returned to the house and was agreeably surprised to hear a plaintive voice calling, Marilla, over the banisters. Well, she said, going into the hall, 
I'm sorry I lost my temper and said rude things, and I'm willing to go and tell Mrs. Lindsay so. Very well. Mrs. Marilla's crispness gave no sign of her relief. She had been wondering what under the canopy she should do if Anne did not give in. I'll take you down after milking. Accordingly, after milking, behold, Marilla and Anne walking down the lane, the former erect and triumphant, the latter drooping and dejected. But halfway down, Anne's dejection vanished as if by enchantment. She lifted her head and stepped lightly along, her eyes fixed on the sunset sky and an air of subdued exhilaration about her. Marilla beheld the change disapprovingly. This was no... Oh, there is penitent. Uh-oh. I, I found it. Oh. I couldn't find it when I was looking earlier. Sorry, guys. This is no meek penitent. Um, the quality or state of being penitent, sorrowful for sins or faults. Um, such as it behooved her to take into the presence of the offended Mrs. Lynde. What are you thinking of, Anne? She said, asked sharply. I am a I'm imagining out what I must say to Marilla, must say to Mrs. Lynde, answered Anne dreamily. This was satisfactory or should have been so. But Marilla could not rid herself of the notion that something in her scheme of punishment was going askew. Askew means wonky, right? Anne had no business to look so wrapped and radiant. Wrapped and radiant, Anne continued until they were in the very presence of Mrs. Lynde, who was sitting knitting by her kitchen window. Then the radiance vanished. Mournful penitence appeared on every feature. Before a word was spoken, Anne suddenly went down on her knees before the astonished Mrs. Rachel and held out her hands beseechingly. Oh, Mrs. Lynde, I'm so extremely sorry, she said with a quiver in her voice. I could never express all my sorrow. No, not if I used up the whole dictionary. You must just imagine it. I have behaved terribly to you, and I've disgraced the dear friends, Matthew and Marilla, who have let me stay at Green Gables, although I'm not a boy. I'm a dreadful, wicked, and ungrateful girl, and I deserve to be punished and cast out by respectable people forever. It was very wicked of me to fly off into a temper because you told me the truth. It was the truth. Every word you said was true. My hair is red, and I'm freckled and skinny and ugly. What I said to you was also true, too, but but I shouldn't have said it. Oh, Mrs. Lynde, please, please forgive me. If you refuse, it will be a lifelong sorrow to me. You wouldn't like to inflict a lifelong sorrow on a poor little orphan girl, would you? Even if she had a dreadful temper? Oh, I'm so sure you wouldn't. Please say you'll forgive me, Mrs. Lynde. What did you notice about her apology? Well, she said she was sorry, but then she snuck in what? She said what I said about you was also true. That's kind of a little sneaky thing, isn't it? It does make you laugh, doesn't it? Aunt clapped her hands together, bowed her head, and waited for the word of judgment. There was no mistaking her sincerity. It breathed in every tone of her voice. Both Marilla and Mrs. Lynde recognized its unmistakable ring. But the former, who's the former person? Um, Marilla's the former. But Marilla understood in dismay that Anne was actually enjoying her valley of humiliation was reveling in the thoroughness of her abasement. Abasement means to lower in rank, office, prestige, or esteem. So she's, because she's kneeling, that's like abasement. She's reveling in it. 
Where was the wholesome punishment on which she, Marilla, had plumed herself? Plumed means provided with adorned with feathers or bir of a bird. So she's like, oh my gosh. Oh, sorry, thanks. She, Marilla's like, oh my gosh, I have such a great punishment, right? And then Anne just made the punishment not as great. So it was like she was like, oh, I feel so good about the punishment I gave to Anne, right? And now Anne did this, and she's like, she's enjoying this. Do you want somebody you're punishing to enjoy the punishment? Heck no. Anne had, re had turned it into a species of positive pleasure. Good Mrs. Lynde was not overburdened with perception. Did, oh, Mrs. good Mrs. Lynde, not being overburdened with perception, did not see this. So Mrs. Lynde just says, oh, she's apologizing. I'm going to take it as an apology, right? But, Mrs., but Marilla, who has good perception can see to the bottom of things. Like some times the people that love you can see to the bottom of something. She knows what Anne's doing. She only perceived that Anne had made a very thorough apology and all resentment vanished from her kindly, if somewhat officious, heart. Officious means volunteering one's service when they are neither asked nor needed. Meddlesome. From her somewhat meddlesome heart. There, there. Get up, child, she said heartily. Of course I forgive you. I guess I was a little too hard on you anyway. But I am such an outspoken person. You mustn't mind me. That's what. It can't be denied that your hair is terribly red. But I knew a girl once, went to school with her, in fact, whose hair was every mite as red as yours when she was young. But when she grew, grew up, it darkened into a real handsome auburn. So that's the dark red or ruddy brown color. I wouldn't be a mite surprised if yours did too. Not a mite. Oh, Mrs. Lynde. Anne dropped a long breath as she rose up, rose to her feet. You have given me a hope and I shall always feel that you are a benefactor. A benefactor means... Someone or something that provides help or an advantage, a benefit. Oh, I could endure anything if only, if I only thought my hair would be a handsome auburn when I grew up. It would be such, so much easier if, to be good if one's hair was a handsome auburn, don't you think? And now may I go out into your garden and sit on the bench under the apple trees while you and Marilla are talking? There is so much more scope for the imagination out there. Laws, yes, run along, child, and you can pick a bouquet of them white June lilies over in the corner if you like. As the door closed behind Anne, Mrs. Lynde got briskly up to light a lamp. She has a real odd little thing. Take this chair, Marilla. It's easier than the one you've got. I just keep that for the hired boy to sit on. Yes, she certainly is an odd child, but there is something kind of taking but there is something kind of taking about her after all um so let's see yes she certainly is an odd child but there is something kind of taking about her after all i don't feel so surprised at you and matthew keeping her as i did nor so sorry for you either she may turn out all right. Of course, she has a queer way of expressing herself. A little too, well, too kind of force, forcibly, you know, or a little too kind of forcible, you know, but she'll likely get over that now that she's come to live among civilized folks, and then her temper's pretty quick. I guess there's one comfort. A child that has a quick temper just blaze up and cool down. Ain't never likely to be sly or deceitful. Preserve me from a sly child, that's what. On the whole, Marilla, I kind of like her. When Marilla went home, Anne came out of the fragrant twilight of the orchard 
with a sheaf of white narcissus in her hands. I apologized pretty well, didn't I? She said proudly as they went down the lane. I thought since I had to do it, I might as well do it thoroughly. You did it thoroughly right enough, was Marilla's comp was Marilla's comment. Marilla was dismayed at finding herself inclined to laugh over the recollection. She also had an uneasy feeling that she ought to scold Anne for apologizing so well. But then that was ridiculous. She compromised with her conscience by saying severely, I hope you won't have occasion to make many more such apologies. I hope you'll try to control your temper now, Anne. That wouldn't be so hard if people wouldn't twit me about my looks, said Anne with a sigh. <sighs> I don't get cross about other things, but I'm so tired of being twitted about my hair, and it just makes me boil right over. Do you suppose my hair will really be a handsome auburn when I grow up? You shouldn't think so much about your looks, Anne. I'm afraid you are a vain little girl. How can I be vain when I know I'm homely, protested Anne. I love pretty things, and I hate to look in the glass and see something that isn't pretty. It makes me feel so wonderful, just as I feel when I look at any ugly thing. I pity it because it isn't beautiful. Handsome is, as handsome does, quoted Marilla. I've had that said to me before, but I have my doubts about it, remarked skeptical Anne, sniffing at the narcissus. Oh, aren't these flowers sweet? It was lovely of Mrs. Lynde to give them to me. I have no hard feelings against Mrs. Lynde now. It gives you a lovely, comfortable feeling to apologize and be forgiven, doesn't it? Aren't the stars bright tonight? If you could live in a star, which one would you pick? I'd like that lovely, clear, big one right over there right over there above the dark hill. Anne, do hold your tongue, said Marilla, thoroughly worn out, trying to follow the gyrations. An odd, an act or instance of winding or coiled around logic. So her, her crazy logic of Anne's thoughts. Anne said no more until they returned to their own lane. A little gypsy wind came down to meet them laden with the spicy perfume of young dew-wet ferns. Far up in the shadows, a cheerful light gleamed out through the trees from the kitchen at Green Gables. Anne suddenly came, to a clo came close to Marilla and slipped her hand into the older woman's hard palm. It's lovely to be going, ho going home and know it's home, she said. I love Green Gables already, and I never loved a pl any place before. No place ever seemed like home. Oh, Marilla, I'm so happy. I could pray right now and not find it a bit hard. Something warm and pleasant welled up in Marilla's heart at the touch of that thin little hand in her own. A throb of maternity she had missed, perhaps. It was very unaccustomedness and sweetness. It's very unaccustomedness and sweetness disturbed her. She hastened to restore her sensations to their normal calm by incalculating a moral. If you'll be a good girl, you'll always be happy, Anne, and you should never find it hard to say your prayers. Saying one's prayers isn't exactly the same thing as praying, said Anne meditatively, but I'm going to imagine that I'm the wind and it's blowing up there in those treetops. When I get tired of the trees, I'll imagine I'm gently waving down here in the ferns, and then I'll fly over to Mrs. Lynde's garden and set up the set the flowers dancing. And then I'll go with one great swoop over the clover field. And then I'll blow over the lake of shining waters and ripple it all up into little sparkling waves. Oh, there's so much more scope for the imagination in the wind. So I'll not talk any more just now, Marilla. Thanks be to goodness for that, breathed Marilla in devout relief. All right, my friends, online, we will, I will list your assignment later. Talk to you later. Bye.